So I finished my yearly reading goal this morning. This is everything I read this month, and I read 18-ish books, so this would be a new record, but, oh, and there's a cat. She just stepped on the microphone. That's not helpful. But I wouldn't really, really count having read 18 books. That's just the way that Storygraph has logged it. I'm going to be more excited when I meet my page count goal, which I am still decent away amount away from completing. Anyway, while the stated goal is to tell you everything I read this month, I am actually not going to do that because some of the things you're going to find out soon and other things I'm going to talk more about in my awards video, which will be coming out in October. So I'll just like give you a brief like, these are the books I read for the awards, but no spoilers for my future content. The first thing I read was Maybe in Another Life by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And I have read some other Taylor Jenkins Reid books, D Daisy Jones and the Six and Forever Interrupt did and I like devoured those two like immediately there is crack in those pages no I have not read the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo I do own it it is on my list just other things have been taking priority <sighs> but maybe in another life was very mid for me it just didn't do it for me it was still a very quick read I just thought it was kind of dull in comparison anyway so the premise is is that there is this woman whose name is Hannah, she has been kind of like a wanderer and she's decided to come home and live with her best friend in LA and figure out what her life is now. On her first night back in LA, they decide to go out and meet a bunch of their friends. And she encounters her high school sweetheart who has been like the only person she had ever really been in love with. And she has to make this decision about if she's going to go home with him or go home with her best friend. And the book follows both decisions. You alternate chapters between the two timelines. So it's definitely not a new premise. It is an interesting premise and it can be really fun to see what authors do with it. But this was just kind of boring. Hannah was not a very interesting character to me. None of the side characters were super interesting. I did like seeing the way the plot came together because it's only Hannah's life that is different. She is inserted into the lives of all these other people and they have all their own you know, stuff going on like her best friend's life and the other people that she encounters. So how the different plot elements between the two timelines come out or come about in either timeline is interesting and that was sort of fun to kind of put together be but you have the same reveals are going to be happening back to back so it's not as engaging as it could have been I think if Taylor Jenkins Reid had made the timelines diverge more it would have had more kind of narrative weight I just think it was a pretty mid execution of what could have been something really interesting I gave maybe another life three stars then I read a book that's a secret that you will find out on Friday. Next was Wild Spaces, which is a cosmic horror about this boy. He's never given a name and his parents who live this kind of happy little existence until his grandfather, his mother's father arrives and then everything just like goes very terribly, very quickly. And it ends very tragically. I mean, it is cosmic horror, like I said. It's a novella, so I don't really wanna to say too much more about the premise. I gave this 3.75 stars. Again, I really did like the premise. I was very caught up in the characters. There's a dog, so that's, you know, a huge plus. But I felt like it needed to be a little bit longer. Maybe not a full novel, but I think it needed to get closer to the 200 page mark because I don't think there was enough dread built up before everything just starts happening. I wanted to sit more in the yeah, what is going on, speculating, because just by the time you start really speculating about what's going on, you start getting the real hints and clues about what's happened, the book ends. Uh, so that was all I thought about that one. Then was Burn the Negative by Josh Winning. First of all, what a last name. Second of all, I gave this book 3.5 solidly like in the middle I use a five star system like story graph system which lets you do quarter stars so solidly 3.5 just exactly in the middle it did what it set out to do and that was enough 3.5 stars is not a bad rating for me just means that I enjoyed the book but it wasn't anything 
super special. Burn the Negative is about this journalist, media journalist named Laura, who has been given an assignment by her boss to go write a story about the modern TV reboot of this cult classic horror film. The twist is, and no one knows this, is that Laura, when she was a child, was in this film, and the film has become something of a cult classic because it is supposedly cursed, as people who were in the movie or worked on the movie died in ways that were reminiscent of the plot of the movie. So once the reboot is announced, people start dying again. But Laura, instead of being a seven-year-old child actor, is now a 30-something-year-old media journalist, so she's going to try to like do something about this situation. Premise was really interesting. As you can see, there's sort of a theme of like, interesting premise, I didn't like the execution because it just kept going in like weird new directions toward the end where I was like, okay. And nothing was really explained, which isn't necessarily a problem because I don't need there to be this like, here's the clear answer about everything that happened in this book. Things can be left up in the air, mystery, confusion, terror, whatever. But the first part of the book really set this up as we are getting answers for what happened. And the narrative style was very direct. There was not a lot of hedging. There wasn't a lot of sort of dancing around stuff. It was very, we're, we're getting to the killing part, like real quickly. So the fact that there was just a bunch of stuff that was thrown in that was the never explained seemed to kind of be antithetical to the writing style and also the way that the plot was set up of less of a horror and more of a mystery. I would honestly classify this closer to like a paranormal thriller or even a paranormal mystery than an actual horror novel. I feel like it's marketed as a horror novel because it's about a horror movie but I wouldn't really class it that way and also the like paranormal element kind of come a little bit out of nowhere they're not foreshadowed as well as I wanted them to be. But this was a fun time. It did the thing. It didn't need to do anything else. It was, like I said, just fun. So 3.5 stars. The Hole We're In by Gabrielle Zevin is about this family of five who are suddenly moved to Texas after the dad decides to get his PhD after attending his son's college graduation. So the son is the second kid in the family. So you kind of have two older kids and there's a pretty big age gap. And then there's the youngest daughter. So the daughter, the youngest, Patsy, is 10 when they move to Texas, whereas the son is like, has just graduated college. So there's a pretty big gap there. They are a pretty conservative Christian family. Before the dad decided to get his PhD, he was the assistant principal, vice principal of a private Christian school that was connected to the religious denomination that he's a part of, which I believe is supposed to be based off the Seventh-day Adventists. I didn't double check, but I'm pretty sure that their denomination isn't a real religion. I think it's just supposed to be riffing off of some of the more conservative traditionalist fundamentalist aspects of the Christian spectrum if you will anyway their religion is very important to the plot but it's not very important to the characters because they're constantly breaking their religious tenets and then using them when they're convenient but what the story is really about is the ways that stuff just keeps happening to the family that is their own fault but they never really make a decision Decision. They just sort of exist. So it talks a lot about debt and how debt, especially credit card debt, just ruins or can ruin your life if you're not careful about it. The youngest daughter ends up getting blamed for something she didn't do, which sends her to live with this, her terrible grandmother for a while. So then her life gets just like completely altered than where she was going because of the decisions her parents made or sort of didn't make, especially the credit card debt. Like the mother who's in charge of all the finances just sort of keeps making these decisions to put things on credit cards without really much forethought and starts putting these things and her, their, her children's names so that their credit is ruined when they become adults. All just these terrible decisions one after the other. The characters are not really likable and that's the point. I have rambled enough about this. I gave this book 3.75 stars because it was interesting. It was intriguing. It was this look into a very specific snapshot of America in the 90s and the 2000s primarily and was an interesting meditation on like kind of breaking cycles of a because we see how the, diff the three different generations that are represented in the grandmother, the parents, and then Patsy, how they all impact each other and eventually four generations with Patsy's daughter and how she's trying to give her daughter a better life. Kind of make amends for the things that her parents did. I'm not doing a great job of describing this book and part of that's because
because it wasn't terribly memorable. It did have a lot of interesting things going on there. I just kind of felt like I was a voyeur in not a good way, that I was just kind of getting the tea on this family. They were vague posting about their lives on Facebook or something, and then I got the tea secondhand, and it made me feel kind of dirty in the end, which I'm not sure was the intention. The Devil Takes You Home by Gambino Iglesias. This one was for the awards video. Um, I gave it 4.25 stars. I listened to this one on audiobook while I was doing house stuff, uh, painting, etc. And this was a very strange book. I will talk about it obviously more in the awards video, but I would say the main takeaway was sad. It was a very tragic ending. Another award winner, The Hideous Book of Hidden Horrors, which is difficult to say, edited by Doug Morano. And like I've had with all of the other magazines and stuff that I've been talking about, it is hard to review anthologies because you have such a wide spectrum of things. So I don't have a star rating for this because I just feel like it'd be too difficult to figure out what my average rating across all the stories is. I will say that I did enjoy a good number of the stories and I will talk more about some of my favorites in the awards video. Then I read some books based exclusively on vibes. So Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies by Heather Fawcett. This was a good head empty, no thoughts. Don't think too much about some of the plot holes that are in the book because they're, they're not relevant. It's just vibes. So the premise of this book is Emily Wilde is making an encyclopedia of fairies, so that's self-evident, and she is on kind of her last stop in her research tour, so to speak, which is investigating these fairies that basically no one outside of the people that live in this community have ever really experienced, and some people think that they're not even real, and so she's here to do this research, and she's apparently like very good at research and very meticulous and etc. And then, oh no, <laughs> her academic rival, his name is Brambleby, shows up and he's a hot shot. According to her, his research is not as well done as hers is, but he just charms everybody. So he's the big hot shot at her university and she's just this nobody, essentially. So she's really hoping that the encyclopedia is going to put her on the map. And Brambleby is writing the introduction to the encyclopedia and that she hopes is going to help with her sales and her recognition. And she kind of resents him for this because she wants to succeed on her own merit. But Brambleby shows up and is like, hey, let's team up. And then will present this paper based on this research at this big conference and then because of my name and fame you will you know get famous by association essentially and she's like I hate that that's a good idea so they start working together on their research and as they're unraveling the secrets of this area they start learning a bunch of new information about the mysteries that are kind of going on there are changelings there are people who are being kidnapped by the fairies there's like an evil tree and so they start learning how all of these things are connected this is the part where I feel like there's kind of a plot hole is that something happens and then the story takes this drastic tonal shift that I was just kind of like, okay, this is what we're doing now. And I did not really appreciate that. It was at that point that I kind of checked out because I felt like this was something I had read a million times before and I wasn't terribly interested in it. I liked it much more when we were doing Brambleby and Emily's banter and all of the research stuff. The research elements of it was very much giving um, a natural history of dragons. Highly recommend. A lot of fun. And then it just took a weird turn that I didn't really like. So I did give this four stars because up until that point, so it was like two thirds of the book, I was having a great time. Just the last third, maybe even just the last quarter that I was kind of like, meh. Then I read The Only One Left by Riley Sager, which I did not realize that was a man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a woman the whole time I was reading the book. Anyway, this was 3.5 stars. It was just another head empty, no thoughts, vibes only. I had a great time. I was gasping. I was shocked. I was awed. I was confused. The twists, the turns, ugh, it was great. So why did I only give it 3.5 stars? Eh, just because it's a thriller. I don't know. They're just not like, wow, my mind is blown. I'm thinking deep and careful thoughts. It's just like, let the good times roll, uh, kinda, because it is, you know, murder. Then, another five star. Yes, yes, we got a five star this month. And it is Profit by, <laughs> I do not know how to pronounce this person's name. I'm going to put the name here and I have no idea. Not a clue. So if you want to tell me how that's pronounced, great. And Helen McDonald. <laughs> 
I'm sorry to this person, I don't know how to pronounce your name and I'm not even gonna try because I'm reasonably certain I will be completely wrong and I am very sorry, but your book was so good. Oh. Okay, this is extremely difficult to describe because this book does not fit into categories. Nominally, I guess this is a science fiction thriller. But that's the B plot. <laughs> the A plot is a romance, but it's not a romance genre. I wouldn't say that because of the science fiction parts. Not that science fiction romances aren't a thing, it's just that this is not that. Okay, so imagine the plot, plot A is a romance, plot B is like a science fiction action thriller but the vibe is lit thick, like the writing style. And you're kind of getting there. This was so emotional. This was intense. I cried. I laughed. I gasped. I was distraught. I finished the book and stared into the middle distance like, what did I just read? There is a before and after in my life now. But I can't really explain to people why this is so good because the book is just strange. So it's definitely a genre bendy. You need to go into it with an open mind sort of situation. But it was so good. Okay, what is the book about? Ra has the ability to tell if something is true. It's not quite like a lie detecting. It's because he can also identify things like forgeries. It's if something is authentic. He describes it as being representational of reality at one point, I believe. He's always been able to do this. And this is a lot to carry uh, from a young age and pretty confusing all around. But he, this is his ability. So when the British and American intelligence organizations discover that there is like a walking lie detector out there, they're like, excellent. So he is put to use in intelligence gathering and in torture. And this sort of breaks his little brain and he ends up getting arrested for drugs and such. Book opens with him being taken out of prison because the British intelligence organizations are like, we need your help. And he's like, great getting dragged back into this, but what choice do I have because I'm in prison? So they drag him off to this place and they bring him some objects and they ask him to like identify which one is different in some way. And he's like, yeah, no problem, this one. And they're like, yeah, that's what we thought. So it turns out, this is all in the first like 50 pages. So none of this is really spoilers. And this is a, this is a chonky book. This is 450 pages. It turns out that on this like airfield military place, that he is now, a bunch of objects just spontaneously appeared. The one that he picked out of this like object lineup is the only object in the lineup that spontaneously appeared. So it's like, oh, these aren't real, right? They're lies, essentially. So now they're trying to figure out, you know, where do they come from? What's happening? Is it aliens? That sort of thing. So he's paired back up with his handler, Adam. So Adam is the only person that's ever been able to like control Rao because he liberally partakes of the more illicit pleasures in life, shall we say, and is just sort of devil may care, bad boy kind of guy. He curses at everyone. He just truly does not care, will tell anyone off because what are they going to do? Like, they put him in prison, but he doesn't really seem to care. And they need him because he's the only one that they know of that has this that has this power. So they're like, yeah, we have to work with this jerk. Because he is a jerk. Like, let's... <laughs> he's an asshole. Adam has been able to sort of manage him, though. So they put him back together with Adam. And then this puts Adam and Rao on this trajectory to try to figure out where these objects came from. And there's all sorts of conspiracies involved. And so this is where it's like an action-adventure thriller plot is about these mysterious objects and where they came from. And it turns out that it's just this giant government, corporate, billionaire conspiracy theory where they have to literally go in in full like combat, whatever stuff and try to take down the evil or like it, exactly what you would expect of an action adventure thriller plot where the government and a bunch of billionaires are in an evil conspiracy with each other to take over the world. But then the other plot is Adam and Rao's relationship developing and it becomes a romantic relationship or kind of. It's, 
it's a very confusing book in terms of how to classify it. So I'm going to stop trying to classify it and just say it was so good. It was so emotional. I was crying. I like had to reread the last pages because I was just like, oh my gosh, what is going on? <sighs> Adam is wonderful, Rao is wonderful, they deserve everything, and it was a wild book. So if you want an action-adventure thriller that is also a romance, that also is a literary fic, this is kind of that. Then I read Clark's World issue 203, which I talked about in my short fiction roundup, so go watch that. Then Emergent Properties by Amy Ogden. Ogden? unknown. This is another novella. This one's even shorter than the previous novella at 128 pages. That is about a AI robot, so like they're embodied, named Scorn. Scorn is one of the, or is basically the first AI robot to be a true artificial intelligence in the sense that they have emergent properties. That's the, the title of the book. Whereas new feelings, reactions, desires, etc emerge organic organically from their consciousness essentially. Scorn's parents, it was this married couple that created Scorn, they intended Scorn to be a like, data collection analyst person because Scorn doesn't need to breathe so to go into like outer space and collect data so that it saves humans lives and Scorn is like no. Scorn wants to be an investigative journalist and Scorn's mothers are like please don't. Scorn's mothers also got divorced and have a very 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 unfriendly divorce and have gotten into public fist fights with each other and actively seem to want to kill each other. So that's like a fun place for Scorn to be caught. So Scorn's investigative journalism stuff takes them on this whole adventure where they learn some conspiracies and how their mothers are involved in these conspiracies. And Scorn has to kind of confront questions of their identity and how they're going to fit into this world and what does it mean to be non-human living in a human world. It was pretty interesting. I gave it four and a half stars because it addressed a lot of topics that I find very interesting personally about non-humanness and what does it mean to be human? Is it possible to be human in a way that's not tied to species? Like can Scorn be a human in the sense that we think of personhood, so to speak? Oh, look at that sun coming in. Wow. So it was just specifically very interesting to me and I thought it was very well written. And I could definitely see this one being up for prizes next year. Then I read House with Good Bones by T. Kingfisher. This also got four and a half stars because this actually scared me. I was spooked. And this was confusingly about a character who has the same name as me, which usually I don't like, but this book was so good that I was still into it. This is T. Kingfisher's most recent release. Going back to horror, I know she did like a couple of fantasy recently, like Nettle and Bone, but we're back to the horror. And I really do think that this is where Kingfisher thrives because the writing style is just so strong. Kingfisher loves a very intrusive narrator. And by that, I mean Samantha, the narrator. It's a first person narration. She is very present, not just as the first person narrator and you're much closer to the narrator who's also usually the main character which is true here but it's a very storytelling style of narration you feel much closer in that Samantha is like telling you directly the story not in a sense where she's like dear reader but kind of one step away from that direct address style and some people are definitely not going to like that I don't think it's valid to like ding the book for for being that way because it's just the like style of narration. It's kind of like saying Gideon the Ninth is a bad book because Gideon's such like an intense narrator. That's the point of the book. So for me though, that style of narration is I love it. If it's done well, oh, it can make it can make or break a book for me. If this story was told in any other way, I would probably not be into it. But because it's told like this, it becomes scarier. The plot of the book is that Samantha is a archaeo entomologist. She studies ancient bugs. She's on a dig, and then they found human remains. So the dig has to be like paused while they figure out like where did these remains come from, etc. And so she'd already told her roommates that she was going to be gone for six months. So they sublet her room, and so so she doesn't have anywhere to 
to go. So she moves in with her mom. And Sam has a very good relationship with her mom. And she's like, this is gonna be great. Spend some time with her mom. But her mom is acting weird. And Sam is like, confusion. Thinks her mom might be getting dementia or early onset Alzheimer's or something like that. And she's constantly trying to figure out what's going on. But things are definitely weird and creepy in the house and the neighborhood. And Sam is just trying to figure out what's going on and to fit everything that's going on into her more scientific framework. What works about this to make it scary is how much effort Sam is putting into convincing herself that there's nothing weird going on. And because you're so close to Sam's point of view, you're also like struggling along with her. You want to believe that there is a quote unquote logical explanation for everything. And this is like the opposite of an Occam's razor. We are going to find the most convoluted path to try to explain away all of the weird stuff that is happening. And when like the weird stuff fully emerges, it's a relief in the sense that it's like, okay, we finally have the answer, but also it's a little bit of a shock to the system at the same time because you've been trying so hard to like justify what's going on. I had a great time. I would, like I said, spooked. Um, I also read this at night in the dark, so that probably didn't help. Next was another award winner, and this is We Are Here to Hurt Each Other by Paula Ash. This was a collection of short stories. The collection itself is only 131 pages. So it's a collection of like very, very short stories. And like with the other award winners I'll talk about this more in my award video but I will say it currently has a 3.5. I am still kind of mulling over this book so I gave it the middle of the road rating for the for now just so that it has a rating but I might bump it up. I'm feeling like I'm gonna bump this up. It was just a complicated book and very gruesome by the way. Don't just pick this up for funsies. This was messed up. We are getting there. Next was a almost five stars and it probably would be a five stars if I was in a slightly different headspace that was like more ready to receive this book and this is part of the reason why I hadn't read it up to this point because I knew what the book was going to give me and I wanted to be in a place where I could really like immerse myself in it really sink my teeth into this but that time has did not come and it's an award winner so I was kind of like well I gotta read it now so if I reread it this will probably go up to a five star I reserve my five star rating for books that give me like very intense emotional responses. Um, so this book would have given me that if I was in like a different headspace this month. And that is A Prayer for the Crown Shy by Becky Chambers. I love, 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 love Becky Chambers. Every single thing she has written has just been like so good. If you have not read Becky Chambers, I don't... I don't know how to help you because it's so good. I actually, this is the one book that I have sitting next to me and I put little tabbies. I have little highlighting and writing all in it because I just, I just ate, I ate it, I ate it all up. So that's why I don't, but it only has 4.75 like I said because I didn't have the intensity of emotional reaction that I normally do to Becky Chambers book because of where I am in my head. So when I said I read 18-ish books, this is the ish in that it is What the Dead Know by Nevo because this is only 31 pages. So it's really more of a short story. Storygraph just actually counted it as a book. So that's why I'm kind of like, mm, that doesn't really count, but whatever. Another award winner, so you will hear more about it later but i gave it four stars another award winner I, I'm, <laughs> I am having to get through these okay i am behind i have like a list on my whiteboard over there of all the ones that i still have to read and it's a lot and most of them are long so we're we are in a race against time to get these all done so where i end by sophie white ah, i gave this one two and a half stars oh I'm sorry. The reason I gave it two and a half stars is that I feel like it did not stick the landing. I told my husband how it ended and he was like mad on the, my behalf for how I wasted time reading this book. All right. And then <laughs> I finished this book this morning and I'm recording this on the 30th. So this one just like slipped right under the radar. And that is Starter Villain by John Scalzi. And part of the reason that I am giggling is because I have my like list of all the books behind the camera and it includes the covers. And the cover for this book is just like, 
inspired. I love it. So this is another in Scalzi's comedy, science fiction comedy books. You have like Red Shirts and then the Kaiju Preservation Society, which I've already talked about. And Starter Villain is like the same vein of being just a goofy, fun little time in a it is not that serious and we are all here to have a little chuckle. So I gave Starter Villain four stars because of the vibes. The premise of the book is that Charlie is not doing great in his life. He's divorced. He is living in his deceased parents house doesn't really have a job he's a substitute teacher middle school teacher doesn't really matter but his rich uncle has died and left him everything and he's like well that's a better proposition than anything i am currently experiencing so sure i guess i'll do that and then you slowly reveal and then it is definitely directly given to you that his uncle was one significantly wealthier than we originally thought and two a villain like classic James Bond style villain and the inheritance that Charlie has received is his villain doings <laughs> which is an absolutely ridiculous premise and the plot is like just as ridiculous as you are expecting and pretty funny pokes some good fun at a lot of different things and was just like a fun little time I couldn't put it down because it was a good a good time I read it super quickly it is definitely here for a good time not a long time and I would recommend if you're looking for just silly fun little goofy time those are all of the books that I read this month I feel like this video was all over the place I have had headache like all day so my thoughts are just kind of scattered all over the place so hopefully you learned something interesting in this video if you did please leave a comment telling me what interesting thing you learned and if you learned nothing just leave like the brain emoji in sympathy of my pounding headache otherwise thanks for being here and sitting through this whole entire video if you did because i keep reading way too many books in a month and if I keep reading this many books in a month these videos are just going to keep getting longer and longer as I have to keep talking about them and just remember a good number of them I skipped over because they're award books and I was like mm, I'm gonna talk about those in a different video so I do this to myself like I could make different choices mm -hmm.